There we go. Okay. Let's do some more. Let's do some more of this FP course. What were we doing last time? I'm just checking out the branch. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming in, Thongies. Um, yeah, thanks thanks a lot. It's not sad that you don't know anything about programming. Hey, how's it going, Nottum? We're going to do uh, some of this uh, Data sixty one FP course. We're going to do some more of that. This is what we we're doing last time. We got through a little bit of it. I'm just trying to figure out where we got up to. The only context you missed was uh, Thongies was saying that he, uh, he doesn't know much about programming, so he's saying it's a, he's a little bit sad that he doesn't know about much about programming, but that's that's all right. There's a lot of things I don't know anything about. Cool. So uh, FP course, Data sixty one FP course. It's just a project to teach functional programming. It's a really good course. I teach it at work, and I am going to. I don't know, I'm just, what I've been doing, what I did last stream was just I uh, went through how I teach it, and just uh, kind of described how to complete the exercises, um, I don't know, in, in like terms that I, I use at work. So, first thing that we talked about was that, um, so I think we actually went through, um, I think there was a bit more than this, we actually went through, uh, yeah, here we go, optional. Yeah, so the first ones were were optional. So just uh, you know, I just taught how to how to do pattern matching and, and run functions and things. So this is mainly just syntax. So we went through syntax around Haskell last time, and showed how you can do pattern matching. So anything where you see a constructor on the left hand side of an equal sign, that's pattern matching. And then uh, 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 one way we can describe pattern matching is like deconstruction. So it's deconstructing the optional here. And on the right hand side is how we construct things. So here we're using the uh, the full constructor to construct up an optional. So this is deconstructing an op optional and this is uh, constructing back up. So that's what that function is doing. And that's what all the functions in optional, there were a couple exercises in optional and that's all they were doing, just deconstructing, deconstructing one, uh, deconstructing the optional and reconstructing something back up. Uh, so after optional, there was list. We went through list a little bit. Um, list is two constructors, nil and cons. Remember, this, this thing is called cons. And this is how you write a list in Haskell. Well, this is how you can write a list. I mean, this is the built-in list, but uh, this is the one that we have to find just above. And we call this a cons list because it has cons, these cons elements in it. Um, and the two, the two main things around list is uh, fold write which is constructor replacement. Um, so fold write, when you give it, you have to give it two values. One is uh, like a function that you're going to replace the uh, cons with and the other one is what you're going to replace nil with. So what this means is in uh, in this list, replace plus, replace cons with plus and replace zero, sorry, replace nil with zero. Do you need type constructors for that or is that different because it's a colon as the first character? Um, you don't need, um, so I think what you what you're saying is type uh, what is it type operators and uh, no I don't think you need type operators because it's a uh, it's not a type Th that is not a type here yeah. this cons is not a type it is a uh, it's a it's a data constructor so list is list is the type and this is just a constructor so cons is a constructor so it's not a type so I don't think we need top type operators. Um, but yeah, it, it is interesting because like, you know, uh, constructors need, uh, need capitals for the first, they need uppercase first characters. Um, but when they're an operator, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit, it is a little, it's a little bit different. Yeah. It's a little bit different, but yep. That's just a constructor. So just read that as a constructor. So fold right is to, when you, when you read fold right, think about, Replacing the cons with a function and replacing nil with a value. That's all that fold write does. It's just constructor replacement. Replacing the two constructors in list with something else. And then we've got uh, fold left, which is just a for loop. Just think about when you see when you see fold left, just think about for loop. So you just got like an accumulator and you go through every element in your in your data type and you run a function. And that's all that does. So fold left is for loops and fold right is constructor replacement. And you can actually implement for loops in terms of constructor replacement. 
You can actually, so fold right can implement fold left. So fold left is just mainly like a convenience thing. Sometimes it's just more convenient to write fold left than it is to write fold right. But fold right is kind of like the is essence of everything the list a list can do. So you can actually just write fold right. Anything you want to do on a list, you can use fold right to do. It might it might not be the most convenient way to write to write it, but you can use fold right to implement whatever function you want for a list. And that's what we continue to do. We uh, there was an exercise head or so fold right const was a way to do that, which is just replace the cons operators. So replace these cons operators with uh with const. And const just returns the first argument, so it just means uh, if this was const, it would mean return this thing, ignore that thing. So we'd end up just with one. Yep, yeah, catamorphism is a is a way of uh, talking about um, folds. Folds are catamorphisms. Okay, so that was head. Product was similar. We're just uh, going through replacing uh, replacing cons with multiplication, replacing it with one. That's pretty straightforward. Every time you see a cons here, just replace the multiplication. Nil is kind of like the uh, we need to replace with like the identity element, so the element that we won't do anything. So this is just multiply everything by one. Multiply them all together, multiply that by one. Sum is pretty much the same, except instead of one, we use zero. That's pretty straightforward. Fold right, we can uh, use this function. We can replace all the uh, cons operators with uh, just plus one. So every time you see this, just replace it with plus one and ignore this element. So go through, replace it plus one, plus one, plus one, zero, and you get the length. We did map as well, which was just go through everything, replace nil with nil, because we're creating back a list. And uh, we're creating back a list, so replace the cons operators with cons, but apply the function. So that's straightforward. Same with, uh, so filter does something very similar, but it may not do the cons. So replace nil with nil, replace cons with something that may not actually cons it back on. So if it doesn't pass the predicate, don't put it onto the list. Um, Is that right? This one's confusing me. So um, usually what we do is yeah, I don't know that makes sense. Okay, so um, this is just replacing cons with cons. But what we do is we replace nil with well, we flip it, so it's replacing it with the second list. Is that right? Yeah. So we're saying on the first list, because there's two there's two list arguments, let's look at it. Uh, oh, I don't have Emacs open. Let me open up that real quick. Um, here we go. There we go. Uh, where were we? Here we go. Uh, So concat, what we do, so we've got these, yeah, we've got two lists that we've got as arguments. It's got one list, and another list. So what we do is we flip it so that the argument to fold right, so remember that fold right takes two arguments, takes the, uh, takes what we're going to replace cons with and takes what we're going to replace nil with. And we're going to replace nil with, we're flipping it, so we're going to replace it with this list, the second one. So over this list, the first list, replace nil with that list, and we go back another list. So that's what a pen does, just replaces nil with another list. Really straightforward. Uh, flatten is just going through each one, replacing cons with, you know, list concatenation. Flatten map. There's a, there's a couple of ways we can implement it, but um, one of them was flatten and then map. Sorry, map and then flatten. And flatten could just be implemented in terms of flat map ID. So you have to implement one of these. You can either implement flat map or flatten. So flatten, flatten can implement flat map and flat map can implement flatten. So that's just what that's kind of demonstrating there. Okay, I think that's basically, oh no, we got up to seek optional as well, which was a, which was a tricky one, which was 
Um, with seek option, what you're doing is you're taking a list of optionals, and what you're doing is you're uh, putting it, you're lifting the uh, list constructors into the optional context. So um, for nil, what we do is we put nil into full, and for cons, we put we say uh, we use this twice optional function, which is a way of uh, if we look at the type of it, it's just a just a way of creating a uh, function, taking a function and lifting it into something that works over optionals. So if any of these are um, if any of these are uh, none, or what is it, empty, if either of these are empty, we'll get back empty, but if they're both full, we'll get back a full of running this function. Is optional your version of maybe? Yeah, it is, yeah. It's the uh, it's the version of maybe that, um, that we've written uh, up here. Yeah. So it's just full or empty, which is just uh, in, in Haskell, in, in the standard library of Haskell, it would look like just or uh, nothing. And that's called maybe a. So that's in the standard library. So twice optional. Uh, you might also recognise that if you're familiar with Haskell as well. But twice optional is just a function that takes a uh, takes takes one function and then lifts it into optional. So what what uh, when we do a sequence, we, could, we pronounce this sequence sequence optional. Uh, what we're doing is we're deconstructing the list and reconstructing it. Deconstructing it here, reconstructing it into here. So deconstructing a list that has optionals inside of it and then reconstructing it with optional list. So it's just lifting these constructors into something that works over over options. That's what sequencing is. Barely read the code so big. <laughs> Alright, so that's where we got up to. We got up to seek optional, which was a which was a tricky one, so we got pretty far, which is good. So um, let's go through uh, yeah, let's keep going through with the list. There's a couple more, um, and then there's a good uh, discussion point at the bottom here. So, the next one is find. So find is, uh, find is taking our list and then uh, making an optional out of it. So it's gonna use this predicate, so let's introduce our predicate into scope. And we should be able to, let's guess that it's going to use fold right. And fold right, if we're going to replace, uh, we're going to replace nil with an optional, that makes sense to um, be empty, right? So I'm going to say that if you replace nil with empty, that means we haven't found anything, because you can't find, you can't, like, you can't find any element or you can't construct an optional of A if you don't have an element to, to construct from. So with nil, we don't like, we don't have any element yet. So I've put in this thing called a hole. So remember things that have an underscore, that's a hole. We've put in this hole and that, all that does is make GHC gives, give us a nice error message. And so GHC says, replace this underscore to do with something that takes an A, an optional A, and gives us back an optional A. So what can we do with this? We've got an optional A, and we've got an A, and we need to give back an optional A. Give back an optional A, and we've got in scope an A, and an optional A. But well, one thing we can do is uh, check our predicate. We can run our predicate on our A. We've got an A in scope and we've got our predicate in scope. So we can say P of A, and that's a Boolean. So let's bring that into scope. So now we've got a Boolean in scope. What can we do with Booleans? What's the, so fold right on Boolean is if. So I can say if P A, So we have to get back an optional A, and what we have in scope, we've got our, so we've got our else, like our, our true branch, if the predicate passes, then we can do something, if it doesn't pass, then something else. What should we do when the predicate passes? We should return back uh, optional of the element, right? So to do, remember, is, is an optional. So this is just full A. 
that's easy. And what should this be? Well, we've got, what do we have in scope? We have O, which is an optional A, which is going to be our, our tail, right? So the tail, we can say, just uh, go through and use the tail. So go through each element, run the predicate. If the predicate passes, give back full, otherwise go through to the tail. And that's all that says. Just go through, just keep going through, uh, checking the predicate. And the first one that passes will give, be given back in the one that are. Uh, and if it doesn't pass, it'll just uh, keep going towards the end. And so we should be able to run find infinity and it should be able to find, this is just a test to make sure that it are, uh, that we haven't written an infinite loop. There we go. So I infinity is, uh, like it's just an infinite data type. It's just that. So it goes on to infinity. And so we, what, what this test is to make sure that we haven't written it in a way that traverses the whole the whole list. We don't want to go through the whole list to check the predicate. We only want to go through the first element and check the predicate if it's true. So const true is always true. So running this should always give us back zero. So that's just a test to make sure we didn't do something silly like use fold left. If we use fold left, this wouldn't have, uh, it would have been an infinite loop because remember fold left is a for loop. If we went through, if you do a for loop over something that's, uh, that's, if you just do a for loop that says like, you know, for i is whatever and true, it will just mean like, you know, loop forever. So just making sure we don't do things like a for loop in our implementation of bind. So we haven't done that, so we've passed. Uh, probably should also just demonstrate that it, that it actually does work. There you go. So it's found tr uh, two, which is the first element that's actually even. Cool. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's go through length GT4. There's a couple ways to do this. Um, it's a bit of work to do this using a fold. Uh, the most easiest way is to just... Uh, I don't like this solution, but it's, uh, it's the easiest way to do it. So what we can do is uh, pattern match. Pattern match on the uh, on the constructors. So we're pattern matching to say that does it have one head? Yes. Does it have two heads, three heads, four heads, and then something at the end? So that could be a nil, or it can be some more list. So is it at least four? It means that like it's got four heads on it. So length GT four. We should be able to run length GT four on five. True. And length GT four. And three should be false. And let's make sure we got the, the boundary condition right, which is four. Length GT4, true. Oh, we've, we've, we've stuffed up there. It is not, that should be not true. So do we need another one? Because it's meant to be G greater than four. Length of list is greater than four, not greater than or equal to four. So that's, yeah, there we go. I think I fixed that up. There we go. Just pattern match enough and, and that's the solution. Um, like, uh, the reason I don't like this solution is, um, like, this is the, definitely the easiest solution, and, I mean, it, it makes some sense. Um, when I'm teaching lists, though, I like to teach fold right. That's the, kind of, like, the, the important part of a list. And so it is possible to, imp to implement this using fold right. It's just, it's just tricky, and it's just kind of tedious. Um, this is not very, like, this is, this is just straightforward, just pattern match. I don't like this solution just because it doesn't teach much about, um, uh, about fold right, which I think is kind of like the important part of list. Uh, doing being able to do pattern matching is, is not very interesting to me. Um, being able to do fold right and, and use fold right to implement this is is really interesting. It's just it's a lot of work, and so and it's not very interesting work. Like we could do it, it's just it's just tedious. So uh, I don't really like going through this one. Uh, maybe I should raise an issue and say I don't really like this exercise. I don't know. I don't really like like I mean data sixty one people must have put it in there for some reason. I need to find out why they put it in there. I don't really get why this exists. I think the people that, that make it probably agree that fold right is is the more important thing and pattern matching is not very interesting. So I should talk to them to find out why why this was actually put in. That'll be interesting to me. Cool. So uh, f doing a reverse, reversing a list. If you're thinking about reversing a list, how would you do it in an imperative language? What would be the first line of code you'd write in an imperative tool? If you if you write, wrote an imperative uh, algorithm to implement this, how would you do it?
go through a for loop and swap all the elements from outside in. We're talking an imperative linked list, but that's, yeah, for loop is the right direction, right? You know, we would use a for loop, but because it's a linked list, what you would do instead is uh, something more like uh, x plus, uh, plus something like that, I think. Is that right? We could do that, um, but what we could also do, <laughs> yeah, I won't do that. So what we'll, what is another way to do it is uh, going through every element, um, but uh, instead of like we uh, we cons it on. So uh, I can write it. Uh, it's kind of annoying, but uh, something like that. How about that? Actually, what I, wrote, what, what, what I wrote before was wrong, actually. That's because it doesn't actually reverse it. That'll just, uh, if we did that, that'll just be the same list, right? We go through every element and we just append that element on. Well, we're just going through it. So that would actually not be, uh, that would not be reverse. This is reverse. So go through everything and then uh, go through every element, but then make it the new uh, beginning of the list. So we're going from the beginning to the end, beginning to end, go through every element and cons it back onto, onto our accumulator. Which is like make it the prepend, so I make it the make it the first element. So go through every element and make it the first element. And now we'll kind of reverse it. So you're kind of taking off one list and you're building up another list in, in reverse. So that's how you would do it in an imperative tool. So when we use uh, when we see for loop, that means fold left. Someone reminded you that it's possible to do pattern matching inception, like for the first character in a list of a wor of words. Yeah, you mean like nested? You're saying like nested pattern matching? Yeah, nested pattern matching is possible. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I'm just translating over the imperative version down here, which is to take every like go through every element and make it the new beginning of the of the list. And what would we do here? Well, we'd uh, have a function a b takes two arguments so we need to return a list of a we've got an a in scope and we've got this list what can we do with those two things well we can uh whoops uh, we can cons it on b and a cons so i'm just following the types here so a is a list of a and b is a which is a bit confusing but just following the types and that just means take this uh, take this element and cons it onto A. So if we try this out, reverse one, two, three, nil, three, two, one. So this is this is the list reverse. So just by taking each element, so we go through one and we put make that the first. So one. Let's go. Let's go through an example. Uh, one, two, three, nil. If we go through the first one, what we'd have is uh, the accumulator is now. So it starts off as that, then we are go one cons, two cons, three cons. So for everything, like we go through this element, because it's full left, we go through this element, cons it on, hit this element, cons it on, then hit three and cons it on. And there we go, that is, that is full, uh, that is reverse. What we could do is if you look at these, if you look at this, um, there's actually a function that I showed before, which was flip, which will flip the order of the arguments. So here we can just do that. And there you have it. That's that's reverse. Go. So uh, fold left. So reverse is is fold left flip cons nil. So if you have an interview and you have to reverse the list, just write that on your whiteboard. Fold left flip cons nil. Hey Ludo, how's it going? Thanks for dropping in. I usually use fold right all the time because of the performance issues with fold le left for very large inputs and also because I don't really get 
why would be one one would be more suitable than the other yeah so um you can use fold right all the time fold right is kind of like the essence of of a list fold right is just constructor replacement it's the important part of a, of, of a list and everything can be implemented in terms of fold right so it's, it's the essence of a list now fold left is uh like just a convenience thing it's something that we can come up with but it's not it's not very essential to a list fold left can be implemented in terms of fold right so if you if you've implemented if you have a fold right function you can implement fold left so fold left is not is not essential. Fold right is, um, but yeah, fold left can be thought about as a for loop. So that's why you can have uh, performance issues with really long things because it has to traverse the whole thing. When you've got a for loop in like a an imperative tool, you have to go through the whole thing. It's a for loop without break. Think of fold left as like for loop without break. We don't have any any way of of of, of breaking. Can you implement fold right in terms of fold left? You can implement the types so the types will go up, uh, like the types will line up. So here's the types, right? The type is this. Um, you, it is possible for you to implement it. It's not the right fold right though. It, you can make it, so what you can do is like, I think it's, uh, I could say fold right equals fold left, like F. So I think I can do that. I think that'll work. That compile uh, fold right prime. So I think yeah, that will compile, and it should have the same type. So fold right and fold right prime. Yeah, they got the same type. So so it's got the same type. So you can implement it in terms of fold right, but this will not do the right thing. So if we do a fold right, so uh, actually we had an example just before infinity, right? Uh, find. So now find. Remember that we had find on infinity. Now, if we replace it with our fold right prime that we just wrote, it doesn't terminate. So it we can implement fold right in terms of fold left, but it doesn't do the right thing. And so this is what languages like um, in JavaScript, you know, we've got fold right and we've got fold left. And uh, they can both they both uh, implement like they, they're both the same they're both both the same thing just with different arguments and that's exactly what we've implemented here we just said that they're both the same thing different arguments but in a language like Haskell they're not the same thing with different arguments because fold right deals with uh, with it's just replacing constructors and so by replacing constructors if you have like a lazy infinite uh, thing that's just built up of constructors and you're replacing the constructors the function that you replace it with um, if that's lazy, then the whole thing's lazy. But when you use fold left, it, 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 that's not true anymore. So, uh, yeah. So the idea is that like fold right, fold right is constructor replacement, and constructors are like kind of like the important thing around laziness. When you're building up constructors, that's like a lazy thing to do. Um, and deconstructing, deconstructing them is 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 when you start evaluating things. And so if you replace the constructors with something that uh, doesn't evaluate everything, then you can actually uh, write things like find, or you can write things like uh, like head or, and have them work for infinite lists. So, yeah. So when you when you write in JavaScript and you got fold right, like that, that's I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes from, where people think of uh, fold right not as constructor replacement, where they think of it as like a reverse for loop or something. So left fold left looks like a for loop to them. That makes sense. But when you say constructor replacement, if people are familiar with JavaScript, that doesn't make much sense because it's just in JavaScript, it's just uh, it's just the reverse uh, fold left. Um, in Haskell, it's different. Fold right. When you see fold right, it's actually constructor replacement. And you can, I mean, you can do it in JavaScript. You can do the same same thing in, in JavaScript. It's just the standard library in JavaScript. The fold fold right is not really not really like a, a real list fold right. So it's good to unlearn JavaScript. If 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 you've learned fold right and fold left from JavaScript, it's good to unlearn. Uh, what fold, fold right means in JavaScript. Okay, so uh, that was reverse. Uh, there's one hit, one thing here which is produce, which is just uh, producing an infinite list by applying a function. So go, given a function and initial value, produce a list. So uh, I could say produce. What can we say? Produce plus one, zero, and that'll just give us an infinite list where we just do plus one every time. So we can take 10 of them. 
So it starts off at zero, that's the first element, then it does plus one onto the next element, plus two, plus three. So that's not really an exercise, it's just something that's there just to show how to how to construct an infinite infinite data type. Okay, and so the last exercise in list is just, it's really just a discussion point. Um, it's not really a, a real exercise. Oh, you, you can treat it as an exercise if you're really interested in it though. And it's, um, let's say we have these tests. We've got not reverse of nil. And this is a property test here. So when we see this prop, this means property test. And what we're saying is X is a list of integers in this expression here. Let me just put a new line in here. that expression there. Let's... So what we're saying is in this expression, not reverse x concatenated with not reverse of y, that is the same as not reverse of y concatenated with x. So we're kind of saying that not reverse distributes over this appending and so what we're saying is we're not specifying uh, we're not specifying what x and y are. We're saying that you can give us any x and any y. It doesn't matter what what list you give me. If you give me if you give me two lists x and y, this property will hold for this function. This property of not reverse distributing over append. So here we've given a list of nil. So not reverse of nil is is nil. Not reverse of these of these two lists are the same is the same as that. And also we've got one more, which is that if you give me any element, I can put that into a singleton list and that's the same as a singleton list. So not reverse of a singleton list is the same as a singleton list. Not reverse of nil is the same as nil. And then not reverse of the of this thing here, which we is, I think we could call it like the distributive property over. Yeah, we are using something like, think of this as quick check. If you're familiar with property based testing, this is this is just like quick check. We're just writing uh, quick check in the documentation here, in the doc, in the in the comments. So in the comment, we specified this thing called a property-based test, which uh, a tool for using that is, is quick check. So this is this will generate a quick check test that we can run, and it will just run not it will just generate a hundred different uh, x's and a hundred different y's, and then test that this property holds. And so if this property was to hold, if this if these if these well, if all three of them were to hold for not reverse, then what would what what's the possible implementations of not reverse? Well, let's say we put in, uh, we say not reverse is the identity function. It takes the list, gives back the same list. So X's gives back X's. Whoops, X's. So that compiles because we're giving, we take a list and we give back a list. So it compiles. But if we do, uh, so one, two, three, nil, we get back what we put in. So now if we were to look at this property for that example that we just wrote, this would be one. Oh, you need, you need. I guess you need two examples. So, not reverse. Let's just go one, two, three, four. Let's look at this this example. So, the property is this should equal and what do we have? We had uh, that should equal. So that's what the property is saying, that this should equal that. So in our example, x is one and two, y is uh, three and four. So that's three, four, plus, plus, one and two. We can we can evaluate the plus, plus part, which just means that it's three, four, one, two. So those two uh, things should be the same. And you can see that if we run it, we get one, two, three, four, not reverse, three, four, one, two, nil, that's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same as that. So these are not equal. So not reverse doesn't hold that property. Is there anything else that we can do to to make these to make these properties hold? And if you go through it, you can try lots of different things. Uh, you could say like drop one. So drop one element from the list. Uh, that won't work. If you could do take one, that won't work either. So we could try one of these. Take one. And if you, if you think about it, if we just in line to take one up here. So take one of X, take one of Y, then that would be take one of both of them. So really one is like taking one, taking and then adding it with taking one. 
and this one's just taking one. So this would be a list of element of list of length two. This would be a list of length one. So they can't be equal. And if you did drop, then you'd be dropping two on this side, but then you'd only be dropping one on this side. So that doesn't work either. So you kind of need something that doesn't change the the length of a list. But also, um, the only thing we know about a is that it, you know it's it's a name. We don't know anything about it, so we can't really do anything with the elements of the list. So there's only a couple of things we can do. And so that, that, that reduces a lot of different, this, this property here reduces down a lot of things. We can't drop, we can't take, so we can't do anything with, we can't do much with the structure of the list. Like we can't remove parts of the structure. So we have to keep all the structure. Um, but we can't do anything with the elements because we don't know what the elements are. So this is really, we've limited ourselves, uh, our, our implementation down a lot by writing down this, 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 uh, this property here. And it turns out the only thing you can do is reverse. So this not reverse function, the only implementation actually is reverse. So this, this name, if we were trying to reason by names, we'd come here and say, okay, cool, not reverse, cool, must not be reverse. But the important thing is actually the types. These types actually tell us exactly what the function is. So even though the name is, is lying to us, the name is saying, this thing is not reverse, looking at the types tells us exactly what it is. It has to be reverse. It doesn't matter what the name is saying to us. Not reverse is the implementation. Just by looking at this, and just by looking at this. This actually, this test down here, we don't actually need. We don't actually need this test down here. That's a, that's actually a useless test. Um, it's enough to just have these two tests here. We can have just not reverse of nil and uh, in this property. So that is enough to fully specify the reverse function. Doesn't matter what the names are. Doesn't matter anything else about, we can write, we can get rid of this comment. Doesn't matter. Um, the only thing that matter are these are these tests and these this type here it fully implement fully specifies what reverse needs to be. Only implementation is reverse. Does that make sense to anyone? We can go through. Um, I can talk a little bit about the tools we use to to come up with some of that. Cool. So that is that's list. And this is just, this is this is important though. We can just use a couple of tests and types to fully specify functions. That's that's really really important. Okay, so moving on to functor. So this is introducing. This is basically a Carl's razor. You don't have other just less likely. No 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 no. There, there are no other implementations. Does that make sense, Freeman? Like, there, there are no, there are no other implementations of this. Like, could try and give me an implementation, and we'll, and we'll, we'll talk about it. If you can give me an implementation of not reverse, um, we'll talk about it. it. Won't, it won't, it won't pass the tests. These, these two tests, and uh, in this type, is enough to fully specify reverse. It cannot be anything else. It has to be reverse. Um, there's even there's proofs of this as well, so I'm 100% confident that's true. Um, I've written I've written a proof of this. Not reverse is not reverse. There we go. Ship it. All right. No, 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 no. The tests the tests are very important. Um, probably testing is, is extremely important because you kind of have like an algebraic way of of. Or specifying tests and using this algebra, um, yeah, using the algebra means that you really, really limit the things down. So, like, like you know how you have parametricity in types to to limit things down. If you are parametric in your tests, that limits things down as well. So you kind of have two layers of, of parametricity. You got parametricity of the tests, saying you're not specifying what x and y are. They can be anything. So therefore, you're, you're making the claim that um, for every list that this property holds. And you're saying for every element, every type here, this uh, this type holds. Yeah, if you if if the list if it was just list the list, I mean you could just say drop one. Um, and so you can make a lot of things that type check, but you can't make things that pass this. Uh, if you if like if you use things like Agdor and Idris, you can make th that the implementation of this doesn't compile if it doesn't pass these properties. You can make that happen, but in Haskell, what we have we've just got types and then we've got these property tests to specify functions. Cool. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, functor and type classes. So functor is a type class. This is called functor. And a type class is a way of, you can kind of think of it as an interface, but it'll break, that, that thinking will break down at, at some point. Um, but you can think of it as an interface for now. Um, you'll probably have questions like, hey, if this is an interface, why can't I do this? And it's because it's not an interface. So keep in mind that this is not an interface, but you can think of it as an interface for now in a way. So we're defining a, a type class functor over f. And we have this method in it that's pronounced fmap. So when you see this thing, pronounce it fmap. And fmap is a fun is, it's a method on, on class that takes a uh, takes a function a to b, and then converts it into a function that takes an f of a to an f of b. So you can think of functor as a way of lifting this function a to b into a function that takes your f of a to f of b. So it's a way of lifting a function into into your f. You get to choose what f is because think of if you're thinking about this as an interface, you get to implement this thing. So you get to choose what f is. So we should see. It. Yeah, here we go. Here's the uh, here's the functor for exactly one. So we've chosen what the f is. F is exactly one. So what we're doing is implementing a method that takes an a to b and takes an exactly a exactly one a to an exactly one b. Introduce the operator rather than the prefix function. Yeah. Um, yeah, we just get people used to use the operators and um, there's operators later on in like applicative and monad so it's better to get people kind of used to this i think talk about the concept of lifting if you haven't yet yeah sure um okay so we have if you just think about it like this uh a to b function a to b we've got this function a to b and this can be like int to int or int to bool. Those are all, all things that could be A to B. And what we can have is, let's say we've got a, uh, so let's say we've got an exactly one. Exactly one of int. What we want, we want to run this function over the int part of it, right? We want to run this function we've written up here, int to bool. Let's say we want to run int to bool, bool over our exactly one. We should be able to say exactly one of bool. And what that would involve is unwrapping our exactly one. If we look at our exactly one, we've got this run exactly one. So we could uh, do this. Run exactly one, run our function over it, and then wrap it back up in exactly one. And that would give us back, that would take an exactly one of, uh, of int, run our function, which is int to bool, and then wrap it back up to bool. And if you look at, the, if you look at what that's doing, if you look at uh, what this type signature looks like, it looks on like uh, int to bool exactly one of int exactly one of bool. And then you should put parentheses around this side as well. Because remember that our functions are, are associative like this. So what we're doing is actually uh, doing this. You can think of it like that. So we're taking this function and then just putting putting our type constructor around it. So this is when we're talking about lifting, what we're really doing is, is doing this operation. So we're taking a function that does one, like uh, goes from A to B and putting it into, into uh, something that goes from F of A to F of B. So lifting is just a way of like, uh, so lifting a function is just lifting, lifting it into a way of, of working over, uh, working over a type constructor. Uh, and we can generalize this a bit more, and that's what we're going to do in the next part. Functor for now, just say that we can uh, lift a function that takes one argument, takes one one parameter, to another to another value. So, thing about lifting right now is just a to b, and then f of a to f of b. We can do a little bit more than that, and we'll do that. Um, but we need a little bit more than functor. Hey, Weasley, how's it going? Thanks for dropping by. So uh, for now, just think about it as a to b and then f of a to f of b. That is that is lifting to us to, for now. A little bit later, we will get into applicative, and applicative we can do a little bit more. Cool. So uh, let's refresh what on exactly one is. Start a type with exactly one constructor, uh, which is just a constructor around a value. We've got a function run exactly one. So that'll take an exactly one of A and then give us back the A. So we'll just unwrap it. 
So here we'll have the F and we've got our exactly one of A. Let's put in a hole and we'll see what we need to implement. Does that make some sense about lifting, Freeman? Um, I'll go through I'll go through a little bit more. When we get to applicative, there's more about lifting. Okay, so we've got an exactly one of A. We've got need to get back exactly one of B, and we've got this function A to B. So what if we uh, one thing we can do on our exactly one is uh is run it. So now we've got an A, which is an A, and we've got this function. Now we can run this, use this function over this value. And what do we have now? We've got a B. And what do we need to give back? A, exactly one of B. So if we just do exactly one of B, there we go. So just following the types through, we can get up, we can get this. And there's actually, there is only one implementation of this. So we, so just by following the types, we got to exactly the right implementation. And just inlining the bindings now, just using composition, and we should be able to say this. There we go. So that's the same thing. So to lift a function, what we do is we just deconstruct the exactly one, reconstruct it back up. Easy. Cool. Um, so functor for list. If we go through the list module, uh, we could just browse it actually. Browse course dot list. Oh, my T marks isn't gone. Uh, T marks. So if we browse this, uh, if we look through here, this actually is a map. We've already written map. And notice how these look exactly the same. So F map for a list is taking a function A to B and a list of A's to a list of B's. That's exactly what map does. So if you're familiar with map, F map is map. So F map is just like a more general version of map. So see how this is specific to list, but F map works over anything. F map works over anything that we want to define it for. So F map works over exactly one, and we can make fmap work for list. And when it is list, we can just say fmap is map because the types line up. So types here line up to that. So we can just say one is the other because the types line up. So fmap for list is map, easy. And hopefully, I think I think I showed map last time. So hopefully everyone's familiar with what map does for list. And here we have a uh, functor for optional. So A to B, optional A to optional B. So we could implement it like this, which is full of A. It's the same as full of F of A. And for empty, it goes to empty, straightforward. Um, but that's already implemented for us as well. I think it's called map optional, is it? Map. If we, if we browse course.optional, <clears throat> map optional already exists. So we can just try that. There we go. So F map for optional uh, is map optional. Easy. Cool. So now it's going to get a little bit tricky. Now we have to write, we call this the reader functor. Uh, Gets more interesting about what reader means when uh, we get into applicative and when we get into uh, when we get into monad. Then reader makes a little bit more sense. But for now, you can just think of this as like the functor for for functions. And the way to read this one, this one's quite tricky. This one, um, we're saying given a function. So this is the type construct. This is the uh, yeah, this is the type constructor for uh, the type constructor for uh, for functions. And the type constructor takes two functions. So when we write when we write int to int. Remember how we can do prefix notation in Haskell? So that's the same as that. Int to int is the same as arrow int to int. Yeah, so instead of being able to write uh, when we want to say we don't know what the what the second one is, we convert it into prefix and then we can say like this. And then we can say that is the same as... Actually, we can say the same as... as uh, as that. So what we're doing up here is saying that this is a function that takes an int. And so let's replace this tuple just to make it more clear. So 
so that's what it looks like. So a function that takes an int and then gives back a bool, we can write it in these three different ways. <coughs> and here what we're saying is we're, this is a function that takes in a t. So we haven't specified what t is, but we're saying it takes in a t and then it gives back whatever we specify. So remember that, uh, that function is defined for a type constructor. So wherever we saw f in our original one, we can replace it with this, which means we can also replace it with that. So those are equivalent. So I think I might actually do that. T to B. I might do that. So what we're saying is that uh, this type we're working over this type constructor. And so we're taking a function that A to B and we're lifting it into that type constructor. So the, the type constructor that is a function that takes in a T. So if we have a function that goes A to B and we have a function that goes from T to A, then we need to go uh, to t to b, from t to b. So we'll have a go at implementing this. So we've got two functions. Let me know if uh, any of that, uh, this, this is, there's a lot of syntax going on here. So let me know if any of this doesn't make sense to you. Uh, just think of it as, this is a function that takes in a t. And what, what we, like the f has now become a function that takes in a t. And that's all you really need to think about. We're running it for we're running a functor for some that takes in a t. So our top L f has gone from f to being something that takes in a t, a function that takes in a t. So here we go. We are yeah, we have uh, we have two things in scope. So I've brought in these two things in scope. F is the function. G is the L is the function that uh, that we're going to map over. Now we need to need to implement this thing to do, which is a function that takes in a t and goes back a b. So let's use a lambda t to something. Because we have to we have to implement this function, right? Implement this function here. So I'm just going to introduce t, which means that we've we've constructed up a function. So now we've got a t in scope and need to uh, implement a b. Curious when function instance for uh, function would be used in production code seems very basic, so it should have a lot of usages. Yeah, it does have a huge amount of usages. Uh, look up reader, reader monad or reader replicative. Um, look up the reader type, and that'll tell you exactly where the functor itself. I mean, the, the functor is useful, um, but it's used a lot with uh, monads. Used a lot and a lot. It's really, really useful for monads. Usually, people call it like the reader monad. They'll be specific, and they'll say monad for some reason. And it, I mean. The monad part's not very interesting. It's the it's the function. It's the uh, it's the monad you get out of functions, and the function you get out of functions, and the applicative you get out of functions, and that's that's the interesting part. Uh, I'm sure the Haskell book at some point will talk about the reader monad. Okay, uh, so we are constructing a a uh, function. After return of b, we've got t in scope, and we've got these things, which seems useful. So we've got a g that takes a t, and that gives us an a. So we could use that. Once we've got an a, then we can use this function, f. Oh, and, and that goes a to b. We need to return a b. So we could just put them together. So what was it? T, g of t gives us an a, and f of g of t. There we go. So that compiles, so that must, this, there is only one implementation of this as well. So uh, this has to be right. And so now I'm just gonna, gonna look at refactoring. Um, so this, what we're doing is just running, uh, taking a T, using that and then uh, using G and F. So usually when I see, uh, when you see something on the, on the left hand side and something on the right hand side like that, you can replace it with composition. So if you see you're introducing a, uh, a variable on, on the left hand side and you're just using it on the right hand side like that, then you can just uh, say it's composition. And here we're doing something as well. We're introducing these two things, but uh, we're using it here. So if you, we could translate it like that. That's what, that's what it translates to. So if you destrigger it in your head, if you destrigger the syntax in your head, it looks like that. And then this is interesting. You're saying that f map of f and g is the same as compose f of g. So, you know, the same things on the left-hand side, if you've got the same thing on the left-hand side as the right-hand side, and to the right-hand side, you can just get rid of it. So this is, this is interesting. This is the functor for functions 
is com composition. So, yeah, the functor for for, uh, for for functions is composition. So it is a generally useful production code thing. You're just composing composing functions together. It's just composition. Cool. So there's not many things you can derive just from uh, functor alone. Functor usually gets a bit more useful when you add in more constraints. So knowing functor about something is not you don't know much. You know you know one thing. You know that you can map it, and that's all you know. So it's not it's not a very uh it's not a very uh detailed it's not a very detailed uh signature. All you know is you can map. So, but there are there are there are a couple of things we can derive, just not many. So we'll derive like uh, I think there's only two things in here that we're going to derive. So we're going to derive this thing, which is uh, given that something is a functor. So this is the way, this is the way that uh, we kind of say uh, this is the way we write constraints. When we have this uh, equal sign greater than in Haskell, that means a constraint. So we've got a constraint that our f is a functor. So a and f of b to f of a. So a f b. We need to get back in f of a. So what can we do? Well, what what we know is that f is a, is a um, f is a functor, and we know that we can use f map on functors. And the only thing we can f map on is f b. So let's go with that. I mean, we've we got a big hint just by the type signature what what we can do and what we need to do. So functor f we've got an f of b. We can't do anything with a. Therefore, we must have to do something with this f b. So if we use fmap, then what we need to do is give it a way of going from B to A. What we have is an A though, so what we can do is just uh, ignore the B, go back A, and that compiles. And that is the same as saying const A. Writing a lambda with underscore and writing const is the same thing. So const A. So that's an implementation, so we call this, I don't know, I don't really know how to pronounce this thing. It's just like a constant constant map, so map, if you've got an f of b, you can turn it into an f of a, so you can say something like, uh, yeah, here we go, this is the one. So go through every element and replace it with seven. So we're not saying what function is, we're not saying uh, how to map it, we're just saying replace it with this element. And this is an honest map producing unit value. So let's look at this. Um, we could need an FA in scope. So then you get back an F of unit, and what we have is an F of A. So there's a couple ways we can do this. So we could say, like we had before, F map. We know that we need to use F map because that's what it are. Uh, that's what it's got in scope. That's all we can do. So then we can replace it with something here to do. What's the whole say it needs to go from, uh, hang on, oh, FA, there we go. So function from A to unit, well, there's only one thing that can do that, which is take in the A, ignore it, and we can get back unit. This is how we construct unit. And that's the same as const unit. That's the same thing, but also, we just wrote that before. We just wrote what, what um, we just wrote that function, which was just to uh, just to use this uh, constant apply thing here. We can get rid of the f of a by doing that. Probably do that in the same as above, right? Yep. Just get rid of the same thing on the left hand side, same thing on the right hand side. If you just put in parentheses, same thing, so you can drop them, you can drop the arguments, and eventually you'll get up enough skill that that's exactly readable. So dropping, dropping the arguments actually makes it more readable for me. Cool. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense around functor, what functor does. Anyone confused about what functor is about? Just lifting a function into uh, a function that works over the over type constructors. And that's all that functor is doing. Lifting a function, putting it into a function that works over the type constructors that you're defining functor for. And functor has one, one method, fmap. Okay, so that's functor. Now we can move on to, I think the next one is applicative. Yeah, applicative. Cool. 
So applicative extends functor, so this is how we read extends. So applicative, everything that is an applicative must also be a functor. So if you go to implement an applicative, you have to make sure it's a functor. And uh, there are two there are two methods on applicative. There's pure, which is a way of taking a value and putting it into our type constructor. And then there's this thing, which we pronounce apply. Is that how they pronounce it? This is how I pronounce it in a way, apply. Yeah, I'm gonna call it, so I'm gonna call this apply. So this is apply, and what's interesting is that with fmap, what we had was, uh, we had a way of lifting a function into type constructors. And this one isn't really lifting a function, so like it's, we've got a type constructor around a function, and then we need to make it into a function that works over the type constructors. So there is, there is some similarity here. So if we look at functor, so fmap looks like uh, functor takes an a and a b to f of a to f of b. I'm going to delete the constraint for now. Just just remember that there's a constraint there. So uh, and this is f of a to b. So this is uh, I think is this what people call the space spaceship operator? I think people call this a spaceship operator. Um, so apply looks like this. So looks like that function from a to b inside of a, a type constructor f to a function f of a to f b. And f map is a to b to f of a to f b. So you can see that there's some similarity here. What we're doing is taking an f of a to f of b. So these these are all kind of types of functors. We like when we say uh, we say this is a functor, but what we really when, if we're precise about it, we'll say this is a covariant functor. So when we write functor, we, we actually mean covariant functor. And when we see applicative, we actually mean applicative functor. And so these are kind of like more generalized versions of, of functor. And a functor is just a way of going from an f of a to f of b. F of a to f of b, that's kind of like the essence of, of these things. So just a way of going from f of a to f of b and you've got different ways of going there. So with applicative, you've got a way of like, you're saying I can map, I can map my way to, to that, but also I can give you a, uh, a function inside of a context and you can use that in some sort of way to create this. So that's what's interesting about the, uh, about the apply operator. They're similar in that they're both ways of going from f of a to f of b, but uh, with applicative, you can just do a little bit more because you've also got this other f in here. So, um, do we have any instances to write? I think we'll implement the instance and then we'll come back to this one. Oh, actually, this is just showing that you can derive, so this, this is double dollar sign, which is just the same as a single dollar sign. So it's just showing that if you have an applicative, and if you only use the applicative operations, you can uh, implement fmap. We'll have a go at this. Um, so we've got this function and we've got this f of a. So we're limiting ourselves to not using, so we've got fmap in scope because remember that all applicatives are functors. So we have fmap in scope. Um, but we're not going to use fmap. We're going to only use the applicative operate, the, the, yeah, the applicative specific operation. So pure and uh, apply we're going to use. So how can we implement an f of b from an f of a and an a to b? How can we implement, how can we use the, the operators? If you look at applicative, the operators are pure and apply. What can we do to an a to f of b to implement this? Well, we, with the apply, we need to have, have an f of a to b, but all we have is an a, a to b. But up here we have pure, which is an a to f of a. So if we were to pure our function, then we'd get an f of a to b. Thanks, Digger. So if we were to go pure f, so what we have in scope now, whoa, what happened there? Yep, okay, here we go. Because uh, it doesn't know which which pure we're using, but you can see this f of a to b. So now we do have an f of a to b, which we can use for our uh, our apply. So we can say x f a. Oops. Oh, wrong wrong sign. I'm meant to be using the applicative sign. There we go. 
So use apply with pure of our function. So we could just replace, let's inline this. And we can also do what we've been doing, which is dropping that side. There we go. So that's how to derive the fmap without actually using fmap. So this, we could actually, uh, if we implemented the two methods for applicative, we could uh, just derive fmap. So we don't have to write it ourselves. We could just say, use the use the uh, stuff that we've, that we've written in applicative to, to implement fmap. Okay. So now let's implement an instance of, of, of applicative. So we'll start off with pure. What can pure do for exactly one? So we've got a, uh, need to return an exactly one of A and what we have in scope is A. And the only thing that exactly one can really, the only way to construct an exactly one is to use the exactly one constructor. And it needs an A, we've got that in scope. So that's pure, that's really simple. So a pure is exactly one, just the exactly one constructor, really simple. Now what do we have? We've got an exactly one of A to B and an exactly one of A. Exactly one of A, exactly one of A to B. We need to get back in exactly one of B. So what can we do with exactly one? If we look at, if we go back to the module, the only thing we can really do, I mean, there's a couple of things we can do, but one of the interesting things is run exactly one. So we could run it. So what we have in, oh, whoops, here we go. What we have in scope now, so we need to get back in exactly one of B and what we have in scope is an F of, uh, we've got an A to B and an A. So we've gotten rid of the, uh, gotten rid of the exactly one from each of these. So now all we have is an A to B and we've got an A and, a, and well, we still got this exactly one B here. We haven't got rid of that. So what we could do is say uh, exactly one, we can construct it back up. So you can see how the types line up. We've got an A, we've got an A to B. So we can use that and then we need to get back in exactly one of B. So we need to construct one back up. Say f of a, so we could say that, and that compiles. So that's just that's just lining up the types. So this is a to b. That's an a. So then we get back a b exactly one. Needs is a b exactly one of b needs to be exactly one of b. So we can just use that function. Easy. So that's one way of writing it. Um, another one though, if we look in here, we can actually see that there's a map exactly one, right? So we could say. Uh, map exactly one so we can get rid of that and we can say map exactly one so get out the function then just map map our thing with that map our exactly one with with that function so that's that's the even easier way to do it and then if you look at this just let's inline this And then we can just drop this from both sides. So there we go. That's apply for exactly one. Hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. Okay, uh, so the next one is list. So we need to give, we've got an A, and we need to get back a list of A. Got an A, need to get back a list of A. What can we do? Well, put it into a list. That's one way to do it. I think there's actually a couple of different, yeah, there's a, there's a few different implementations of lists. So you could do a couple of different things here, but we'll go, th we'll go through this one. This one's a simple one, which is just take the A, put it onto, onto an empty list. Easy. So that's a way of promoting an A into a list. And now we have a list of functions and a list of A's. We need to get back a list of B's. Thank you, Lemty. So F A. List of A's, and we've got a list of A to B. Uh, let's look at our list module. Is there anything useful we can use in our list module?
Just looking for, I'm just trying to find something that's, uh, no, there's not really. Okay. Um, okay, what's the easiest way to do this? Um, that's a good question. Easiest, well, I guess we can, we got the F of A, so we could, uh, go through the list of functions. Is that the easiest way to do it? Uh, so you get back a list of B's and we've got a thing from list of B to list of B. Hmm. Well, what we have is, uh, what can we do? Uh, so if we, um, Look at the types again. Got a list of a list. So we'll, oh, okay. So what we could do is uh, what we had before. I don't think we've talked about it before actually. Um, but there is actually something. There is. Here we go. We implemented this flat map. We did implement this flat map. So I think flat map is useful. So I think we can flat map our um, our functions. So what we have, what we, we want to say, like for every function here, run it over this list. For every function, uh, use this, like run that function over the list, this list. I hope that makes some sense. Go through every function in this list, run it over this list. So that's what we're trying to do with that map. With, well, sorry, with with flat map. Flat map. Go through every function. And run it over. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do something here. We're gonna use this to do. So to do is a way of going from we've got this function and we get and we need to give go back a list of b's. And what we have is a list of a's. So that's that's easy as well. So we can say uh, map. What is it? So we got this. Uh, let's introduce this thing. So we've got this a to b, and we've got a list of a. What can we do with that? Well, we can map. So we can map our a's with our f. There we go. So that compiles. Okay, that wasn't that bad in the end. We can write it like that. Now that means we can get rid of this. There we go. So go through every function, run it over our list, and we get back a list of piece. So that is an implementation for, for list. I think there's actually a couple of different implicatives for list. So you could probably write some other ones that are valid, but uh, that's the one we're going after. The one that the, the straightforward one, which is you know just put it into a list of, of one and then go through uh, go through every element and, and just run the function. And this kind of does like a Cartesian product of all the things because we're running every single function over every single element in the list. So you kind of do a Cartesian product of the elements of the list. Okay, so optional pure for optional is straightforward as well. We've got an A. We need to get back an optional of A. There's only two things we can really do there. We can either get back a full or empty. Usually we want to use the A. It's very rare for us to not use the A when we're implementing an applicative. So we want to use full of A. And now we've got this thing. So we've got a function, we've got a um, optional function and we have an optional value. And um, I think the implementation we can actually uh, kind of take from the one before, uh, which was if we go through optional, We had this bind optional that we wrote, which is going to, let's look at it, so F A. The way I think about, like the way that you can think about optional is that it's just a list that um, has like a maximum size of one. So it can be either zero or one. You can think of it like that. So when you're, when you're writing, uh, when you're writing functions for it in, You've written something for list. You can kind of think of optional as just uh, being a list of, of maximum value one, of maximum length one. So if you have you know done like a flat map, then a map inside of a lit for a list, then maybe you can do the same thing for optional. It's just because because they're in similar in structure. So bind optional. Let's use that. And then what was it? Map optional, right? Flip map optional. So I'm just copying what we what we did above, but uh. Doing it for optional, and that actually type checks as well. Just because they're so similar, so instead of a, 
instead of conting onto onto nil, we can just say full, and then instead of flat map and then map, we can just say bind and map. Bind and flat map are kind of synonyms. The flat map is usually how uh, in Scala we talk about in Scala we talk about uh, bind uh, in terms of flat map, but in Haskell we just call it bind. So they're the same thing, just just different names. In Haskell we call it bind. In in Scala we call it flat map. So if you bind the optional to get the function out and then you map that function over the optional, then type checks. And that's the, that's the implementation for optional too. Actually, when I say that, um, if I ever say that you know, this is the only implementation for applicative, that's not true because there's actually, for every applicative there's two, there's two implementations, which is uh, the, it's the, um, you can reverse the arguments. So you can kind of reverse these things. So um, and that, that's a, that's another valid applicative as well. So there's kind of one straightforward one where you kind of like use the first argument and then use the second argument, but you could also do it in the reverse order and that's also an applicative. So there's always two, at least two applicatives for every type, for every data type you write. Um, it's kind of like the flipped applicative. So if I'm kind of like come up with a straightforward one and say that's the applicative instance, um, there's also another one where you can just reverse everything and it's also a valid, a valid applicative. We just go through, go for the one that, you know, just uses the, the things in order because that's the that's the conventional one. You can always derive the other one by using another type as well. So, all right, this is where we're going to get interesting with the uh, with the reader. Where we had the reader func functor, it was just a composition, but with the applicative, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a little bit uh, a little bit more interesting. It's more than just composition now. Okay, so uh, with pure, we have got an A we need to give back. Remember that this syntax here is the same as that. So for pure, we get an A and we need to give back a function that takes a T and gives back an A. Well, that sounds like we're just ignoring the T because we don't actually use the T in the return type. So we can just say const A, that's the same thing, right? So pure for functions or for the reader is const. That was easy. And let's rewrite these type signatures again. So that's the same. That's the same. So if we have a function, if we have a function that takes t and gives back an a b, and a function that takes a t into an a, then we can get a function. We can get that. All right. So to do is something that takes. This T A B T A. It also takes a T, so put that T in there. So it might be a little bit confusing because it looks like here what we have is two arguments and then we've got a function. It looks like we're taking like two things here and then we're we're giving back a value. But uh, remember that that's that's the same as that. Those are equivalent. So now we've got one, like one, two, three things coming in as arguments. So we've got these, it's the same thing. So we need to give back a B and we have all of this stuff in scope, all of this. So we've got a T and we've got a T to A. So we've got it, we can get a T and we can get, can get an A. And then we've got a T, we got a, can get an A and then we can give back a B. That's what we need to give back. So really it's just applying, what was it? It was applying T A B with T A B with T, we've got a T. And then we need to get a, a so we can say uh, T, A, T. So if you just follow the types here, that gives us the implementation. So what's interesting about this function though is how you use it. Uh, so the implementation is pretty straightforward. You just follow follow the types around and eventually you'll get, get to the implementation, which is just use T twice. Notice that T is being used twice here. So T is used here and T is also used here. So that's what, that's what makes uh, this reader thing interesting. So we can actually, use apply on our functions. And what it's going to do is use our three, um, use our thing twice. So uh, that example is maybe not the most straightforward. Uh, yeah, maybe that one. So we're saying plus five, and then we're saying plus, right? So this is one plus five and then plus one again. So this one is kind of getting used twice. So this is going to be six, 
and then plus one, so seven. So it's just that this thing gets used multiple times. So you can kind of write a function and use this uh, thing as many times as you want. Use the argument to the function as many times as you want. You can see it up here as well. So it's three plus 10 and then plus three. So it's just, it's just using this three value. You can use this many times as you want in this expression. So you can build up a big applicative and it just reads from the, uh, we, we kind of say this is the environment. So you can read from the environment uh, a few times. Uh, this th this data type is useful for uh, things like uh, configuration. If you have a, if you have a data, if you have like a, a program that does something with configuration, you can say, you can just kind of read the configuration as much as you want. And so you can say here, like if you've got a fun configuration that has like a, I don't know, like a, a URL that you need to hit, you can say, okay, over here, I'm going to hit the URL and over here, I'm going to read from the environment and, and hit the URL. So this is really useful for uh, things like configuration. Really useful. The, the, and we call this the reader, the reader applicative. Uh, there's probably some blog posts you can find if you type in like reader applicative or reader monad into, into Google, you could find some things. Okay, so I think that is all of the applicatives we're going to define, and that was the, the last one there was the trickiest one. Sounds like some kind of fallback. Um, not sure if I'd call it a fallback. Um, it's just something, it just means that if you write a function, you write a function, you can uh, just make it read from from uh, what what's passed in. And so you can just use it as many times as you want. So it's a, I wouldn't really say it's a fallback. Like it is possible for you to write a function, but what you're doing is just writing a constant function. So I can say here constant five, right? And so this is not reading from the environment because it's just using const. So it's just like hit, give us five, and then plus plus one. So like it's back six. So it is possible for you to kind of use it as not reading from the environment. Um, and then sometimes read from the environment. So depending on this value they pass in here, it may or may not actually use this one here. So there, is, you can kind of think of it. I wouldn't really think of it as a full. I wouldn't really say it's a fallback, but you can kind of kind of use it like this, where if uh, you don't have to read from the environment, but you can. And remember that um, const is the same as uh, for our, our applicative. Const is the same. Pure and const are the same thing. So we can just say pure five, which means don't do anything around the. Uh, with the applicative value, just don't do anything with the with this value that's getting passed in. Okay, so this is where we're getting into more general lifting, like what I was saying before, Freeman. When I was saying that uh, lift takes a function and lifts it, like a function a to b, and lifts it into uh, f of a to f of b. Now we can write with using this applicative, we can actually write lift two, which takes a function that takes two things and gives it back a function that that takes two two things inside of a type constructor. So A to B to C can go from can go to F of A to F of B to F of C. So it's lifting it, lifting many uh, many arguments in a function to um to a function that takes many uh, type constructor arguments. And so let's implement this. So we're going to use applicative, and we've got an F of A and an F of B. So what can we do with uh, what can we do with applicative? We can uh, map our uh, so we can map this and then get back an f of, of bc. So let's let's look at what that looks like. So let um, so we've got our uh, got our function and we can f map f of a. If I reload this, we have what we have now f of bc is an f of b to c. And remember we've got our um, applicative our applicative operator, which takes an f of a b and f of a to f of uh, to f of b. So uh, what we can do instead though is like f of b here. So we can apply this. So we can use our, our spaceship operator or our apply operator to to run this function over this thing. Thank you, thank you, Wuzzles. Thanks for the follow, Wuzzles. Oh, 
Oh, thank you so much for the subscription, Wuzzles. Thank you so much. So we should be able to... Hang on, what am I doing? I've gotten distracted now. What am I doing? Ah, uh, here we go. FFB. FFBC. Thank you so much, Wuzzles. There we go. Is that the same thing? Am I, uh, no, I flipped it. Hang on. Yeah, I flipped it. There we go. So that is an implementation of, uh, of lift two. I think we can get rid of those parentheses there. There, there we go. So what we're saying is uh, map f of a, so then that becomes an f of b, c, and then give it that, uh, you know, apply with f of b, so then we get back an f of c. So that makes everything line up can drop some more arguments again. Just straightforward refactoring right there. So there we go. So this is so this is more general lifting. So lifting before what we had was uh, f map, which was lifting of a to b to f of a to f of, c, of f of b. And what we can do now is um, lift even more arguments. So a b c f of a to uh, f of b f of c. Just, just adding more arguments on it. So now what we can do is one more. Let's go to lift three. So A, B, C, D, F of A, F of B, F of C, F of D. So we're lifting a function that takes many arguments, many parameters, and then uh, lifts it into a function that uh, that works over type constructors. So you can kind of see what's happening here, right? A, B, C, D, F, A, B, C, D. So it's just kind of making one function and lifting it into, taking one function, lifting it into, into uh, a type constructor, F. As long as we've defined an applicative for f. So let's do this f, f, a, f, b, f, c. There we go. And what did we do before? We had f map, right? So f, f map, f, a. What do we have? We've got a f of f b c d, and what we can do is our uh, is our apply on f b because remember that it's a uh, b to c of d, c and d. So this will kind of like give us an f of c and d, c to d. And then we could say apply maybe f c. Just keep just keep applying. Just keep running our apply function. Now we've got an f of d, which is what we wanted. So there we go. So lift three is just running map and then apply, apply. And you can keep imagining what lift four is gonna look like. F, F, A, F, B, F, C, F, D. So you can probably imagine just by, you know, if you, you can probably use your imagination to come up with this one. F of B, F of C and F of D, there we go. So there you go, that's lift four. So taking something that takes four arguments and lifting it into, a, into things that work over type constructors over four arguments. Does that make sense, Freeman? Does that, this is like a more general idea of, of lifting. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense now what lifting is doing. Lifting for function, lifting, the normal lift, like the thing that we usually call just lift, um, is fmap. So lift and fmap are the same thing. Lift and fmap just being the same thing and all it means is just taking a function and, and making it work over type constructors. Taking a function a to b, making over work over type constructors f, so you can get from a to b to f of a to f of b. And then we got um, when we when we introduce applicatives, then we got like more general version of lifting. So we can take a, a function that takes any number of arguments and turn it into a function that works over any number of type constructor as arguments. Definition is still confusing to you. Let's go. Uh, let's go back up to lift two. Then we'll, we'll go over it again. Okay, um, so what we have in scope, oh, whoops, uh, let's introduce this one back in scope. So hopefully this makes sense up to here. We'll go over the implementation because this, this is tricky, right? Um, so we've got a function a, b to c, and we've got a function now, then we're turning into a function that takes an f of a and an f of b, and we're gonna get back an f of c. So hopefully the, what, the, the type signature makes some sense, and hopefully this part, we're introducing parameters, hopefully that makes sense. So we need to give back an f of c, and what we have is an f of a, f of b, and this function. What can we do with any of these? Well, one thing we can do is map, right? We can map our f of a with our f. 
that's pretty much all we can do. There's nothing else we can do. What we have in scope is uh, uh actually one thing we can do is pure. And that's another one. Let's let's go. We'll we'll go with pure. And let's let's see if that's more readable. There's there's kind of there, there there's actually another totally different um, implementation. It's exactly the same, but it's uh, slightly different syntactically. Um, so let's go. Uh, let's use pure, right? So let's go. Pure f. Okay. So now what do we have? We have a function. We got f of a to b to c. We got an f of a. So what can we do with these two things? Remember our reply operator, right? So our reply will take an f of a. We'll take a, a function inside of of an f. And you'll take an f of a, and then we'll use that on the on the parameter. So we'll just you know pass the argument here, the the value from this uh, from this uh, type parameter here, and pass it into here. So if we were to apply on this, what we get back is an f of b to c. So let, let's do that. So if we were to apply here f of a. And what we have now is an f of b to c. So hopefully this makes some sense, right? We've we've used this supply operator. The supply thing takes a takes something on the on the left hand side which is in f takes out our a and kind of puts it into into the function so what we've done here is just we've this is just a re-implementation of fmap this is just the same thing as fmap those are both the same things so what we're doing is uh just taking our taking our um using a function to apply it over our a and that's all that's doing and giving us back an f of a sorry an f of f of uh, whatever the return type of our function was so this was B to C, so now we get a F of B to C. So hopefully it makes some sense, right? We're F mapping over F of A, so that's just passing A into our F, we get back a B of C. Because it's F map, that puts us in, into F. But we could also write pure and apply. And that's just re-implementing our, that's just re-implementing F map, but pure will take our A, A, B, C into an F of A, B, C, so that will lift into, I'll turn it into that. F A B C, and then we can use our uh, apply operation, which takes a which takes an F A B C and an F of A and gives us back an F B C. So it's just uh, there's just a couple of different ways we can uh, use our function over our F of A. They're both equivalent. They're both exactly the same same way, just syntactically slightly different. Like pure and apply is the same as fmap. We remember how we wrote, we derive, uh, we derive what uh, what fmap looks like. So F, uh, we derived this one before. So that's just the same implementation. So we're just writing fmap in a slightly different way when we use pure over here, pure f. Map. Let's just write. That's just these are the same things, same things right here. But they're just uh, just a way of going from just using our a inside of our f to get back this. F of BC. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. F map the function over F of A and we get back BC, which is the return type of, of this function. So A, remember that you can put parentheses in here. So that's the same thing. So hopefully you can see how this, if you do F map on FA and this function, you get back an F of BC. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So now that we've got that, now that we have that, x is an f of b to c. And we have an f of b. And if you look at the definition of, uh, definition of our apply operator, f of a to b, given an f of a, you get back an f of b. So f of b, B goes in there, so then we get back what the return type of this function is. So that's C. So you get back an F of C. So just it's just really just lining up the types. Uh, so lift to so line up the types here. What we can say is apply with F of B, and there we have it. That should be the implementation. There we go. So it's just use our use our A with our function. We get back a B of C. Then we can use this apply to give our B in here, and then we get back a C. So F of C. Cool, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Got lifting, so that's the generalized idea of lifting. 
kind of get away just by looking at the signature because it's full polymorphism, but when still not used to the yeah the the apply function in pure. Yep. Yeah, it takes a little while. Uh, I recommend having some practice with this. It's it's quite good to get practice with the polygative operator. It's uh it's really powerful. Okay, so uh, let's write this thing. So f of a and f of b. We've got an f of a and f of b in scope, and we need to get back an f of b. So, what can we do here? We need to give back an f of b, and we have an f of b in scope. Okay, let's just return that. But now we're ignoring this f of a, and we've got this applicative thing in, in context. So, it doesn't seem quite right. This test will pass. But why do we have this applicative in context, and why do we have this if we're just going to return the return the second argument, it doesn't really make much sense, so let's look at the tests. What do we have? Uh, hmm. This one's not going to pass. Let's reload it, and yeah, so you see my answer is different from what this is. So that's not the right implementation. So what it needs to be is well, this is a list of length 6, and this is a list of length 2, and this is a list of length 3. So if you think about it, you can say, okay, well, this is mul like it's multiplied. It's multiplied the lengths of these together somehow. So these are this is 3, that's 2. So it's somehow multiplied it, but it's only used the elements in the right-hand side. So somehow we're using this thing to kind of get the length out of it. We're kind of getting the structure out of the first one, but we're not using any of the elements. So what can we use in, in applicative? Well, we can use this applicative operator. What do we have in scope? We have f of a and f of b in scope, don't we? Well, let's let's do this. So how about we go lift two f of a and f of b? Remember, lift two was a way of um taking two. Uh, let's look at lift two. Do that. There we go. So let's look at lift two. Lift two takes an f of a and an f of b, and we have an f of a and we have an f of b. So it does make some sense, I think, to use to to look at lift two, just because the types line up, right? We've got a, we've got a f of a and an f of b. And so now we just have to make a function a to b to b. So how about now where we have this uh, thing where we kind of Ignore the A. And there we go, that's the that's that's the right answer that we were looking for before. So we're kind of lifting in the function that ignores the first thing but then gives us back the second thing. So it's kind of for our list, what it was is remember that it was flat map, so it's like flat map this list. So it's the same as flat map. Ignoring the element though, because remember that we've got the underscore here, so we ignore the element and return back this thing. So ignore each, each element, but give back this uh, give back this second list here. So that's the same thing. So that's that's what the implementation of our uh, of this is for for list. It's the same thing as this, because remember how we in our apply we use flat map, in our apply operation we use flat map. So this is just these are just equivalent. These are the same things. Yeah, what I'm doing, what I'm doing when I write in underscore to do is uh, that's called a hole. We call that a hole. So this is called a hole. To do is a hole. So to do is a hole. So it says found hole to do, right? And it gives us back the return type. And then I look at the relevant bindings. Those are the two interesting things. This thing here, the return type, relevant bindings. Those are the those are the interesting things. And when I when I kind of like just uh when I put in a hole and then I look at what the relevant bindings are and I kind of try and fill in the hole that is called hole driven development some people have, have named it that hole driven driven development where it's just it's just a, a, maybe it's like a pretentious name for like just uh you know just following types it's just you're just making types line up um and you've got a useful error message from ghc and that's basically it just useful error message that's all that that's all that a hole is it's just a useful error message it's just a way of getting the return type for something getting ghc to give you the return type of something that's all it really is
and I actually can just rewrite this. So remember how uh, const is, you know, use the first argument, ignore the second one. Um, but if we flip const, if we flip const, then uh, we get back the original function. So this should be the same thing. There we go. Tried to do it for the definition of map and it didn't quite work. But those lift function, it was obvious how to fit the Lego type blocks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the more the more uh, parametric, the more uh, the more it fits together. So it's always ideal to be as parametric as possible. The problem with your uh, with your example there, your, your map over lists, is that lists are involved. Which you, you can still do whole driven development. It's just not as uh, it's not as straightforward uh, because you got you got you got the idea of a list. When we when when we were working on a on an applicative here. We don't have the idea of any type specific, specific type. We are just saying for all applicative, and all we know about applicative is two things. We know pure, and we know apply. We know those two things about um, about applicative. So, because this is not uh, specifying what f is, it actually makes whole driven development easier. So it's actually easier to implement this because it's more abstract. The more abstract something is, the easier it becomes to to use types to to implement it. So it's always a good idea to be as abstract as possible when you're implementing a function. Being specific actually makes functions harder to implement. Okay, so let's implement this one. So let's do the, let's use our reasoning again. So we've got f of b and f of a. Need to get back in f of b. So lift two, let's use our lift two thing again. So we've got f of a, f of b. Let's look at this. So our to-do needs to be a function b to a to b. So this is this is just a const this time. So remember, const is just a function that takes a a to b to a. If you just if you just swap those around, b to a to b. So if we look at this, it's just const. And we can actually drop these because these are the same same arguments. There we go. We'll probably do that above as well, actually. Yep. Drop it there. Drop it here. Same thing. So let's make sure the tests work for this one. It's possible to implement something that's not quite right in this. Uh, let's go this one. Yep, that looks good to me. Cool. So, I don't know. I, the way that I pronounce this is kind of like, a, I call this one right apply. And this one I usually call left apply. It's not, not a great name, but right apply is just a flip const and left apply is just const. Just lifting const. Just ignore ignore the elements on one of them, and use the use the structure of it. Okay, so now we can implement this thing called sequence. Okay, sequence, sequence. Yeah, these aren't exercisely. Oh, they are. Okay, so sequence. We'll work on sequence. And so sequence will take an applicative f and a list of f of a and give us back an f of list of a. So remember how we did, um, what was it called before? Seek optional. In seek optional in list. Now the thing is, um, notice how these are very similar signatures. They're similar, but f over in our seek optional is optional. But remember that um, optional is applicative. So we could actually say that sequence, we could actually instantiate the f to be optional. And we'd get back the same signature as this. It'd look exactly the same if we just said that f is optional. So if we instantiated the f to be optional, we'd get back the same thing. And that actually, this is actually the implementation for uh, for optional. So this is uh, this is the same function. We just now now that we know about applicative, we can actually generalize it. So here we're just being specific about optional. Here we can generalize it and say for all applicative, it doesn't matter if it's optional or another list or or reader or anything that is applicative. Uh, we can actually make it work like this. So we're generalizing it. So what did we do over here? We had fold right twice optional, full and nil. Okay. So let's see. 
Notice how this is specific to optional and this full is specific to optional. Those are the only two parts that are specific to optional. So the implementation, we already had an implementation over here. It was just specific to optional. So what can we do to generalize this? Well, for our um, implementation of applicative for optional, we had full as pure. And what's the implementation of twice optional? If we look at twice optional, what's the type of twice optional? Does this look familiar to anyone? Does anyone know what this looks like? So this is optional A, optional B, optional C, and with A, B, C, what does this look like? We've just been doing a lot of things around this sort of thing in our, in our applicative module. What does this thing look like? Twice optional might even give you a hint, twice. There was something we were doing to get a, B, C into something that looks something similar to this. So if we use, instead of using twice optional, we could use another function. What function could we use? <laughs> lift two, exactly, you got it, lift two, lift two. So that is, lift two is the generalization. So if we look at lift two, notice how these are very similar, so a, B, C, A, B, C, optional A, optional B, optional C, F, A, F, B, F, C. So these are the same, just uh, generalized. No, you exactly got it, it's exactly lift two. It's, um, it makes, it, yeah, so optional F, so we know that um, uh, op uh, optional is an applicative, so we could actually just substitute optional in there. And so lift two, if we say lift two for optional, is the same as twice optional, same thing. So here what we've done is we've just taken out the parts, we've just generalized this function. So sequence, we just derived it from uh, taking this function, optional, and, and generalizing it. So everywhere we saw, like when we saw full, we could just replace with pure. And when we saw twice optional, that's lift two. Same thing. So there we can have sequence and implement it. So now we've, we've automatically implemented it for our, automatically implemented it for our things like this. So this is using, uh, I think this is reader, is it? Yep. So reader. So it uses the reader of, um, you, you, we've got functions inside of it, so it's, so it's read, this is the reader applicative. So here, when we when we sequence this, what we do is uh, get back a function. If we look at the sequence of this, now we've got a function. So we had a function, we had a list of functions, and now we get back a function that returns a list. So we give it six, and what it will do is si put six into here, so remember uh, that you can use these six multiple times. So this is multiplied by 10, six multiplied by 10 is 60, and six plus two is eight. So this is like the reader where we can use it and reuse it, and reuse this value as many times as we want inside of our, inside of our computation. Or we can come back with the optional. Is there an optional example up here? Yeah, exactly. It's a sequence. This is, this is exactly uh, what we wrote before, which is, uh, was it seek optional? Exactly the same. So we've derived the uh, same function by, uh, from a more, we, we've, we've derived a uh, specific one, seek optional, from a uh, general sequence. And if we were to sequence lists, it kind of just uh, kind of flips them. Cool, okay, now I can show this one as well. So exactly one, just, just you know, it just takes exactly a list of exactly ones and converts into exactly one of list. Straightforward. Cool, so uh, I think we'll, I think maybe we'll, yeah, we'll have a go at, um, I think we'll finish up with clicky and then I'll end up, end up there. Okay, so let's go repl replicate, replicate, okay. So replicate takes a number, like an integer, and an f of a, and we need to give back an f of list of a. How can we implement this? We need to give back an f of list of a, and what we have in scope is an f of a and an int. If we go through list, you'll actually see something. Uh, you actually see this thing, replicate. Actually, I think is that is that showing in the tests? Maybe the tests use replicate. No, it doesn't. Okay. So replicate one of uh, true. Replicate twenty true. So it just gives back a list um, with your uh, 
list of the size that you've specified and the element that you specified. So this is a, a list of length 20 that has true as the elements. So it's just, you give it an element, you give it how many times you want it, and it just makes a list out of that. So if I was to replicate our f of a to a list, I mean, uh, the, the thing is, like, we can write, um, replicate and f a. Whoops, not fail. So let's say we want to make a list of 20. Like, let's reuse some of the logic of, of replicate. So we only, so now we've got a list of 20 um, of our f of a's, a list of 20 of them. And we need to get back a f of list of a's. How do we go from a list of f of a to an f of list of a? Something like a generalization of lift to arbitrarily many arguments along the lines of list of a to a to f of a, list of f a to f a. Um, yes. Uh, maybe not. Uh, that looks a bit reversed. Uh, I was about to say that looks like, uh, that looks like, um, traverse. But then it looks reversed. It looks like a reversed, a flipped version of traverse to me. Um, Hmm. There would be there would be a generalization for that. I don't know what it's called. Um, there's like a it, lo it looks like a, uh, uh, a dual version of uh, of traverse to me, uh, which is like distributable or distributive or something. Distributive. Yeah, it looks something like this to me. Something, oh, I'm not sure. I don't know. This is kind of the direction I think so, though. The, the type signature to me looks a little bit maybe like distributive. I'm not I'm not quite confident. It's just, it looks like traversable but flipped. And I guess that's what tri distributive is. So I'm, I'm taking a guess that that looks like distributive, although I can't I can't really make it out in my head. I'm going to say this is this is getting in the direction of what you're asking, maybe. Um, but yeah, not, not easily in a way, like the, not off the top of my head, like there's nothing, this is getting pretty advanced. I've never used distributive, so yeah. Okay. Um, so to answer the question that I had before, which was how can we go from list of F of A to F of list of A? Well, we just wrote it, sequence. So if we just sequence it, we get the answer. So we can just sequence. Whoops. And hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. What we're doing is we're replicating our f of a n times. So we get like a list of a list of f a's, and then we can sequence that. So then we just get an f of list, which lines up. So we should be able to run our examples up here. So replicate. Uh, So take four, so that so if we did replicate that, so then we've got full high, full high, full high, full high, and remember our, our sequence, what it does is kind of flips the two type constructors, so it takes a list of something and then rebuilds the list inside of the type constructor. So full high, full high, full high, full high, it'll deconstruct this outer list and then reconstruct that list inside of our type constructor. So then you can see the similarities there. And, and the implementation as well. The implementation is just use this thing and then sequence it. Straightforward. Okay, uh, so filtering. This one's going to be a little bit tricky. Copy paste driven development. There's a massive amount of code reuse in here. I don't see any. There's. I don't think there's much copy paste. I don't know what. I mean, I do. I do copy paste the the examples that they've given. Okay, so we've got a predicate and a list.
Predicate and list. Okay, so we've got a list of A and a, a predicate that goes through A to F of bool. And we have a F of list of A that we need to return. So this one's a bit tricky. So what can we do with the... Uh, was so hoping for actual tests that run themselves. Yeah, they're in stuff called paste. Yeah, um, there are um, these are actually runnable. Uh, what is it? So if I open up like a Nick shell, um, I think there's doc test. I don't know, I've never really run these. Yeah, there we go, it's not really working. But there's this thing called doc test. Doc test, these are these are called doc tests, and you can use this this function uh, this this program called doc test. I can't quite remember how to do it. There's actually I think in the README. Oh there we go. So list dot Yeah, that was me. Okay, cool, so I can get rid of that. Get rid of my to do. Oh, this might work. Is it working? Hey, there you go. So you can actually run the tests like this. Doc test. Run the doc tests. Actually, I think they might have removed doc test in the in the latest version just because it was a little bit broken. It's just not not doing quite the right thing. But yeah, the, I mean, there are tools for doing this. I think they actually converted over into like tasty specs or something like that. So you can actually there is a, there are, if you are doing the FP course that. You don't have to do it the, the silly way I'm doing it, which is copy and pasting everything. Although that's fine as well. It's not that big of a problem, but there are actual tools. There's things like doc test and other tools inside of the uh, inside the repository. If you look at the readme, if you look at the readme, it, here we go. It tells you how to run the tests. Here we go, running the test. There's actually a part in the readme to do it. I don't, I don't bother. I just, you know, go through and, and show these particular examples. When I'm teaching this, I just go through and copy and paste just because I always try and do the lowest common denominator. Even when, I, when I'm actually teaching it um, for work, I actually don't even use Emacs. I just, uh, I use Nano just to make sure I've got no editor integration, no tab completion. It's just the way I teach it just because I just want to make sure that, because um, some people, you know, struggle to, to get set up with it. So I just, uh, I try and make sure that I don't uh, have any more tools than what the people that I'm, I'm teaching do. So I just use, use Nano, I use GHCI, um, and I copy and paste things. And it's it's like not a great setup, but it's it means that at least I'm level with anybody anybody else that that's doing the course. I do recommend not having editing any integration when you're teaching, and actually it's it's pretty good because um, then you. Don't automatically, you know, use type completion. People go, where did that come from? Um, yeah. So just use Nano. If you're teaching this, just use Nano. That's my recommendation anyway. You don't have to. It's probably fine, but I, 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 I think people do enjoy that. I don't have any syntax highlighting or anything. I just can kind of explain it. Um, kind of explain everything. Yeah, not even syntax highlighting. I don't, I don't think... Uh, you know, like uh, people that some people, a lot, mo everyone that everyone that has everyone that sets it up does pretty much have syntax highlighting. But I just I just like to make sure that I don't have syntax highlighting, just in case there's someone else out there that can't get anything working and has to use Nano with me. That that, that has happened I've, in the first couple of classes. There were a couple of people that like try setting up Atom or something and didn't work, and so then they they ended up using Nano with me. Looks like GFS, G sequence FS is a function I wrote for the signature earlier. Oh, okay. Um, interesting. Okay, I'll have a look at your signature again. Okay. That's interesting. They split Adam. Yeah, it was a bomb. Okay, so we've got, what am I doing? I've got this list, let, let me get back on track. <laughs> I've confused myself. So I've got X's, got a list of A's, so I'm gonna fold right over this. Fold right to do X's. Stuffed up there, oh right. So what are we gonna do for, uh, what are we gonna do to return, to replace the constructor with, well, the, the, the nil constructor, um, where we need to get back in F 
of list. So to me that's pure nil, just because we need to return back an f of list and we need to replace nil with something. So replace nil with um, you know, applicative version of nil, the, the thing, uh, nil within the, the applicative context. So now we've got one thing to implement, which is this function, which is a to, which is f of our x's. Okay, let's try again, let's reload. Okay, so now what we have in scope is all of these things and we need to implement this f of list of a. And we need to use our predicate. So let's, I know that we need, we've got our predicate and we have an a in scope in now. So we can, we can do something here. So we can say uh, if p a, then to do one else to do two. Reload that and what we have now. So we've got two different holes, but they're both, I mean, they're both the same type. Oh, here we go, didn't match. Oh, okay, right, because our predicate is in, our predicate is actually in f of bool. So it's not actually, it's not actually returning bool. So let's say, let, all right, so now we've got, what do we have? We've got a f of bool and we've got an f of list and we have an a. So what can we do with these two things? Well, we can lift. Okay, so we can, because P, P of A returns an F of bool and Fx is, is our F of, of our list. So it's this thing here. So now we need to implement to do, which takes a bool and a list of A to list of A. So let's say it takes a uh, Boolean and our list. So if we reload this, what we'll see is that we've got our Boolean, we've got our list, and we need to make a new list. So what we should do is if the predicate passed, then you know, put the element onto our list. Otherwise, it's just our list. So hopefully, okay, that compiles. So that is that is it. That is, the, that is those are the steps. I'm gonna um, whoops. I'm gonna extract out one of these functions here. So I'm gonna say where uh, f b x is. I'm gonna extract out this part. And we can drop this from both sides. And we end up with something that looks like that, hopefully. No, it doesn't like that. All right. I need to add A in scope. So just add it there. There we go. So there we go, that's the same thing. So what I'm just doing is making a local function definition here. Local function definition. And all it does is it just runs the predicate gets out the boolean and then if the boolean is true then we cons it on otherwise well we ignore that element so now we've got a function called filtering which will be able to um, be able to do things like this so we actually return a boolean so exactly one a boolean and for every element it'll kind of like put that into into our uh, For every element, it'll kind of wrap it up in, in, in our constructor that we use. So if we have like this function from uh, integer to Boolean, wrap it up in a constructor, then we'll kind of get this, this thing out here. And if we actually have like a real predicate, well, I guess even is a real predicate, um, but we can do something like this as well. So go through everyone. If it's greater than uh, 13, oh, we don't have an example there. We'll have to... So this one, what's this one do? Oh, here's the first one, right? Okay. Oh, those aren't those aren't very interesting either. Here we go. How about this one? So this one just ensures that our uh, a is greater than thirteen. If it's greater than thirteen, then empty. So empty is our short circuiting way. So this will short circuit in this example here. Because we've got a thirteen, and we've got a fourteen. So this will short circuit. So it will give us empty. 
but um, this one assert that everything is less than uh, less than or equal to seven. It'll filter everything that's less than or equal to seven. So it'll put this one's in full. So this is kind of like so this is kind of like uh, if this is if this is uh, greater than thirteen, then we short circuit. Otherwise, then we apply this uh, filtering predicate. So there's kind of like two levels of kind of filtering going on. One where it's kind of like short circuit. If anything doesn't like if if anything uh, uh, passes, if anything is true, if this is true for anything, then short circuit out and return give back no elements, but then only give back elements that are less than less than seven, less than or equal to seven. So it's kind of like a short circuiting part of it and also a like filtering part of it. So this, this is kind of like a complicated function. So that's why the implementation is. It's got a little bit going on as well. There's lifting going on, but then there's also the predicate that we're running. Haskell syntax highlighting, highlighting is complex, actually. Yeah, it is. Yeah, there's, there's some reasons for that, which kind of sucks. <clears throat> you was right, you can, only, you can implement that function only with applicative. Oh, interesting, cool. What part of applicative is not implied by functor? That's a that's a good question. So um, so applicative implies functor. We can actually implement uh, what we've done here is uh, implemented fmap in terms of applicative. So only using a pure and apply, we've implemented uh, Im Im implemented fmap. So functor itself doesn't have any idea of of combining two f's together. So if we go to functor. So I mean the first the first part of applicative that's not implied by functor is, is pure. Like you can't you can't like pure is just a just a thing of taking an A into an F of A. You can't do that with, with functor. But the second thing you can't do with functor is um, so functor can lift a function from A to B to F of A to F of B. And you can do that with, with applicative as well. But um you got this second F in here. So that's what that's the interesting thing about uh, about applicative. So if you got rid of this pure and you, you ignore that, the difference between F map and apply is that uh, apply has got an another F, so it's got it's got two F's to deal with, and that's what makes uh what makes apply interesting because it's got two F's to, to 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 deal with. That means that um when you go to implement applicative, you get to do something with the second with the second uh, type constructor. So if for example with optional, this is like an optional and an optional to an optional. So with with F map, you just have this. You've only got one optional to deal with, so you can only do basically one thing. If it's empty, it's empty. If it's uh, if it's full, then you can run the function over it. But now you've got when you use apply, you've actually got two two optionals in scope. So you've got um, you, what happens if this one's empty and this one's empty? What happens if this one's full but this one's empty? What happens if this one's uh, empty but this this one's full? So you got you kind of got like a um, you got m many different uh, possibilities with. Fmap, you've only got two possibilities. One, it's your your optional is either full or it's empty. But when you've got um, when you've got applicative, you've got many different possibilities. With um, with list, you've got infinite possibilities. I mean, like with when you're fmapping a list, you've got uh, infinite possibilities of lists. But now you've actually got an infinite possibility of lists by another infinite possibility of lists. So it's like what what can you do with applicative when you've no two different structures of lists? And so that's that's what's interesting about applicative is that it gives you um, it gives you two type constructors to work with and it's a way of combining two different type constructors and so that's how we've derived things like uh what have we derived we've derived like our, our sequence because we've got and we've got um you can't write sequence using functor because you've got many different type constructors you've got a list of of these uh, values that are working inside the type constructor and because we've got this apply thing that kind of takes two different uh, values of the same type constructor. Um, we can use applicative to, to combine these things and so we can actually this is something we can write using applicative because we can take um, all of those type those values inside of that type constructor inside of the list and combine them together in some way so the the kind of the thing that's implied by applicative that's not applied by uh, functor is is that you've got more than one type constructor to work with you're combining type constructors in a way. So that's what's interesting about applicative. You, you can combine type constructors. Well, you can combine values of the same con type constructor. Whereas with functor, all you're doing is lifting a function into, into a type constructor. So that's that's what I'd say is interesting about applicative. There's actually a different way of, of, of talking about applicative. So instead of having this, the, the second way we can talk about applicative is like uh, tupled. So we can say f of a, 
exactly. Lift A2 is the important bit. Yeah, exactly. Lift A2 is the important bit of, of, of applicative. And we can actually say, um, this is kind of like a different way of, of writing, um, of, of, of writing applicative, which is that if you give me an F of A, and there's actually, there's actually quite a few different ways to, to talk about applicative. Um, hmm. Let's talk about, we can talk about like this one. Uh, some people call this zip, it's not quite zip, but you can call it zip. Uh, zip with zipped. These are, uh, these, like, these are different from like the list operations, zip with. Some people call it zip with and, I don't know, zip. But uh, these are different from like what the conventional like uh, list zip with and list zip do. Um, yeah, it's a little bit, little bit different. Um, but you can think of it like this. So like a function A to B to C, F of A, F of B, F of C. So that is one way. So this is lift, this is lift, right? Lift two. So you can actually, you can actually specify applicative by specifying uh, that it's a functor with lift two and pure. Yeah, exactly. So that is, that is the important bit. Or you can, um, you can actually like be even more, more specific and well, not even specific. You can say that it's the same as this, which is some people could tuppled. Um, which is that if you give me an F of A and F of B, I can give you back an F of A and B together. So it's just a, it's just, um, you can get that as like, that is exactly, uh, toppled is lift two of, uh, toppling. So you know, take an A and a B and give back, whoops, A and B. So that's the same thing. Like it's all, they're all, they're all, um, they're all equivalent. So you can specify applicative using, uh, lift two using this apply operation or uh, using uh, this toppled kind of zip with thing. And they're all, they're all equivalent. If you've got a functor in scope, you can kind of F map all of these things to be equivalent to each other. They're all, they're all the same thing. So they, they all exactly specify what, what applicative is. So you can think of it as lift two as apply or as, um, as like the top link type thing. With pure, pure is also important for applicative. Um, there's actually something called, um, you can actually get rid of the applicative and then you get something called apply. So if you look up, it's data functor apply, I think it is, which is just apply without the, without the, uh, without, sorry, it's applicative without the pure part, which is also a useful data type. That's, it's just, it's different. So there's things that you can't get with that, but, um, yeah, pure gives some, some other things, but, um, there's also some things you can write with, with apply that you don't need, you don't need pure for, so, so it applies a useful data type as well. <coughs> um, yeah, whether it's zip with or not depends on how you implement your list instance. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's like, I mean, there are data types like option. Uh, I don't know. There are other data types that we ha have like zip with, and it's not quite um, equivalent to what you would usually call call zip with with applicative. Um, yeah. So, the, so the idea is that um, applicative has a couple of different uh, couple of different ways of being represented. Zip with, like the zipping type thing, or uh, lift 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 to. You can say lift to or kind of like zipping or toppling um, and this apply operation. And the reason why this uh, course uses this apply operation is because it looks like this. It's a way of going from F of A to F of B. F of A to F of B. And that's the, that's kind of like the, and you can kind of see the similarities. So it's just the reason why, why I like teaching it like this, even though the other ones kind of make more sense to, to people. Um, The other ones, the other ones have other benefits, but the way I like teaching it is like this because just because you're showing how applicative and functor fit together, and I think that is really, really critical. I think it's absolutely critical to teach that applicative and functor are not magic; they are just ways of of going from F of A to F of B, and that's kind of like the important thing I think. And they're just just showing that the ways that you change this part, the part on the left hand side is the way that you get new new things of these. So n nothing is special because eventually we'll get to this operation. We'll get to next time, we'll get to this thing. And it looks like that. And so I think it's really important. Um, actually, I think the next one we're going to show is, uh, is that the, is that, the, is that the operation actually? I can't remember. It's either, it's one of those. It must be this one. Yeah, it's this one. So next time we show that uh, monad is that thing, which is A to F of B, F of A to F of B. So these are so, so similar. The only thing you're doing is changing this thing and between applicative and monad, all you're doing is changing when the F is. So it's just, it just shows, 
how these are all, all very similar. Eventually you can kind of see how there's a hierarchy between them, like um, this thing, there's no type constructor. This thing, there is a type constructor, so you can kind of see that that's more information than, than, than uh, fmap. So apply has more information than fmap. And when we come here, where well, we can say that there is a type constructor but only when we know what the A is. So this is kind of like more information than this thing. So combining all together, you can kind of show that there's a hierarchy and also that there's nothing special about them. They're all just different ways of, of doing that. Monad is not scary. If you, if you figure out what, what fmap is, you can figure out what monad is. It's just what, you can just build up to that just by looking, just by changing the uh, argument to, to this thing. So hopefully that makes some sense why I like teaching it like this. Um, I think it's like a, it's just a good way of showing, um, just a good way of showing that it's a way of going from uh, a value in one type constructor to uh, to another value in that type constructor. Nothing special about it, just a way of, of changing, of, of mapping one value in a type constructor to another value. That's all it is, just changing the, uh, the, 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 the constraint on how to map, that's all. Cool, so there are a lot of different ways of writing applicative. Um, I prefer teaching like this one though. Cool, okay, so um, I think that is all of applicative. Um, are there any questions before? I think I might sign off after this and get some work done. Uh, next time I might go through um, Monad. Monad is the next one in the series. So we can go through what Monad is and what it means. Uh, yeah, the next one is monad. Uh, I guess I guess um we can keep going. How does the third imply the second? Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, so the monad. Yep. Yeah, okay. So bind. How does bind imply this one? Um, that's a good question. Um, I've been. Mean, I guess. I guess. Uh, actually, I'm thinking that might even be the. That's actually such a good question. I think. Yeah. That is the answer for. I mean, that's that's like the first exercise of the next one. That is the first exercise of the next uh, of the next module. How do we derive applicative from monad? So we'll, we'll talk about that next time. Hopefully you'll be around next time, World Endo, because uh, yeah, that's the first. That's actually the first exercise. That's such a good question. It's the first exercise. Cool. Any other questions before I uh, before I sign off? Makes you wonder how programmers coding languages do not allow these abstractions. Monofunctor, applicative monad. Yeah, I mean, Go. You can't even write monoid. Um, in, in, in Java, you can write monoid, but then you can't write things like a functor, applicative, and monad. Yeah, it's, it's like, I mean, the benefits we get out of writing, uh, so you saw how we write sequence, right? The benefit we got from writing sequence, they don't have equivalents. Java, Java, you cannot write sequence in Java. You can't write this. What you have, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure to save it. I'll, I'll probably put it up on YouTube. Uh, that's what I did with last time. So I might, I might link to my YouTube below. Uh, after this, I'll link to my YouTube, and uh, I usually put these videos up on YouTube. I shorten them down slightly, but just cut off the ends. Um, so sequence is a very useful function that we wrote. Um, so what you can do in, in Java is write this. For, oh wait, no, that, not that one. List. In Java, you can write seek optional. In Java, you can write this. Right, that's easy. List of optional A to optional list of A, but you cannot write this. In, uh, in Java. And it doesn't have this thing, higher kind of types. So in Java, it doesn't have higher high, high kind of types. Some people have tried to try and model it, but it uses exceptions and stuff, so it's it's not it's not higher kind of types. Um, so you can't write this sequence function. So you can't write this generic form of sequencing. So anytime you need to sequence something, which is all the time, that I mean, that's like 90% of my day, like just sequencing shit all the time. So, um... <sighs> Being able to um, be having to write sequence over and over and over and over again is super super tedious and it just takes up so much time. Like a lot of the time when I write Java, it's just writing sequence or writing traverse or writing, um, I don't know, just writing writing a function that's already derived for me in Haskell. It just takes it takes me so long to write anything in in Java because I'm just constantly deriving things that I get for free in Haskell because they're already written and they're just a composition.
Okay, I'm not sure what you mean there, World Ender. Um, those types are... I'm getting confused by all the types there, but uh, hopefully next time... Um, you'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to put these on YouTube in a way, so hopefully, if, even if you miss next time, just check it out on YouTube and you'll be able to see, hopefully, the answer on how to derive. Uh, or you can actually, how about you have a go yourself? Uh, download FP course from Data61, that's a good exercise. Ha uh, download FP course from Data61 and have a go at implementing this uh, this one here, which is in Monad. So look at, load up your monad.hs. There's uh, the definition of what a monad is, but the first exercise in there is this, which is deriving applicative from monad. So try and have a go at that. And I'll actually, um, what I'll push is, I'll push, uh, I'll push the code that I wrote today, and I've got a fork. So if you just look at the forks, if you just browse the forks, I've got a fork there. Oh, there's a lot of them actually. <laughs> Um, if you go to my GitHub, um, I'll have a fork there. Look at the branch. I'll have a branch called Twitch. So look at the branch called Twitch, and you can have everything that I've saved up until today. You can clone that out and then have a go at uh, implementing this applicative. Cool. So uh, yeah, if you if you don't get around to it, I'll I'll do it next next time, and I'll put it up on YouTube anyway. So we'll have a go at uh, this one. This will be the first exercise to do next time. Cool. Any more questions before I sign off? Thanks for coming in today, everyone. Thanks for the awesome questions. This is NixOS, yeah, that's right, this is NixOS. I use NixOS for everything, absolutely everything. Yep, I, I use NixOS, um, I've got a couple of laptops at home that I use uh, NixOS on. I use it on my personal laptop and I use it for work. So this is actually my work laptop that I'm working on at the moment. And uh, yeah, I use it for everything. It can get a little bit tedious. There's sometimes at work, sometimes they, people ship binaries to me and I have to try and run binaries and NixOS is not great at running binaries. Um, so I've got some workarounds, but other than that, NixOS is, is awesome. I couldn't imagine using anything else other than NixOS for, for doing work. The worst case with NixOS is that I kind of like boot up like a little Docker image and I just work in like an Ubuntu Docker image for binaries and things. Yeah, this, this interface here is just i3. I'm just running i3. And yeah, it's just not... In simple i3 meaning it's not it's not really configured. Yeah, I haven't really configured it much. I'm just using i3 just because it's a small little thing. Um, I'd like to use like a, a window manager used. Um, I don't know. I imagine other window managers. I've I've written some window managers before, and I imagine other window managers. But you know, i3 is good enough for for streaming, so I'm happy with it. Cool. Okay, I think I'll leave it there. This is NixOS. You've been watching uh, me implement Data61 FP course.